Hi, I'm Dr. Neil Kleiman at the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. By the way, soon that'll be a full paragraph. And uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. John Carroll, who many of you know, and who is visiting us from the University of Colorado. And I might add, I was really hoping that we'd have some great weather so we could show off Houston to a native, or at least to a resident of the Rockies, but the weather's not cooperated. So John, we are absolutely delighted to have you with us. I wish we could have done better on the weather for you, but nonetheless, welcome, and it's very much our privilege to have you with us today. Thank you, Neil. It's a great honor to be here, and a lot of fun, these, these occasions of interacting professionally and personally. I think we all are stimulated by them. So John, let's cut to the chase, at least to start. Uh, you're uh, very much at the center of a good deal of attention and what is in some ways a roiling controversy, and that is the TVT registry, the Trans Catheter Valvular Therapeutics Registry, which as most of our viewers know, is a registry that captures really all the transcatheter structural intervent transcatheter valve related interventions that are done in the US. So uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by this. How did you get into it? Tell us a little mm. bit about the dynamics of starting a registry that really in our field at least has uh, has achieved a tremendous amount of importance and is a tremendous source of data for us. Yeah. Well, the genesis of the TVT registry was, uh, you know, officially uh, through the national coverage decision, where CMS uh, would cover TAVR, uh, but wanted further evidence development to see whether this transition from the pivotal clinical trial to commercial widespread clinical use uh, was associated with uh, similar outcomes. And back in the early days of TAVR. You know, the, it was a lot of complications. Well, we remember. Yes, and so that was an essential part of that. Uh, secondly, uh, through the efforts of Bram Zuckerman and AFDA, Michael Mack, who was then president of STS, and David Holmes, then president of ACC, there was also a moment of, I think, great clairvoyance on their part of saying, okay, this is a brand new th treatment that's going to be disruptive in, in many ways. It's going to change the paradigms of management of valvular heart disease that really hadn't been changed much for decades. And we want to do this right, and we want to learn from it. And so creating a registry was um, to not only meet CMS's needs, but also to provide a platform by which we had a, a knowledge machine that we could all learn. We all know that we learn from every patient we care for. Somehow uh, that can be combined with a registry where it's a national learning experience, where we share knowledge. And we were very interested in trying to accelerate uh, the understanding and the approval of new therapies because uh, in the US, the FDA had always been seen as, as very strong scientifically, but slow in bringing new treatments to U.S. patients. Uh, the U.S. was something like the 44th country to have TAVR. Yeah, I remember uh, being told that very clearly by Marty Leon in his introductory lectures on TAVR. Yeah, and I can remember back then knowing that treatment existed and seeing these elderly patients who didn't have a surgical option and knowing uh, they're, they're not going to do well uh, waiting uh, for that. So what, uh, what attracted you personally to developing the registry and how did you go about it? Well, certainly I did not develop the registry. I was one of many of the early people who said this is an important effort and we want to volunteer our time and our knowledge and experience to doing that, to develop uh, registries, so it occurred in different stages of, uh, uh, fortunately, the, the, uh, the two professional organizations, STS, already had a national database, and the American College of Cardiology 
had, had uh, its own family of registries. Um, and so they were very savvy at d developing clinical registries and, and running them. Um, first steps were what kind of data do we need to develop uh, and gather from sites? What's going to be Im important? Yeah, we wanted patient characteristics, we wanted procedure characteristics, but we also wanted to change clinical registries from really focusing in on an operation or a procedure, to, but to the outcomes and following people more long term. Uh, not only 30 days, but one year. And, and so partnering with CMS was important so we could link the two databases to get things like uh, not only survival at one year, but were people being rehospitalized with heart failure? Were they being hospitalized with stroke, et cetera? We wanted to get long term outcomes incorporated. Finally, we wanted to um, take things like patient reported healthcare outcomes from a research technique to a standard clinical uh, approach of assessing from a patient's viewpoint, did this treatment have an impact? And so the Kansas City Heart Failure Questionnaire, the KCCQ, is a, a patient uh, uh, questionnaire that gets at quality of life, functionality um, from a patient's perspective. And doing the survey, a questionnaire before treatment, 30 days and one year after really got us uh, into a position where we were able to say, okay, if you're alive one year later, are you better in your minds? And that's particularly important uh, with uh, aortic stenosis is predominantly a degenerative disease now in the elderly. And so the uh, early on, the average age of patients having TAVR was 83. It's still 80. So we need to understand whether we really are uh, helping these patients in not only avoiding the high mortality of aortic stenosis, but of maintaining independence, of feeling better, and able to do more. Well, let me ask you this. Um, uh, we've seen lots of data concerning quality of life and improvement uh, following TAVLOP. How long do you think we're going to have to keep tracking that? Do you think the questions about improving quality of life have been answered yet? And if they have, uh, do you see a point where that part of registration is uh, going to end up being dropped? Oh, it might be dropped from a regulatory standpoint. The national coverage decision mechanism eventually uh, ends uh, at, at some point. Um, but I think uh, the, the KCCQ standardizes uh, history taking that when we talk to patients. Uh, we want to know how they're doing, and, uh, whether they're symptomatic from the disease, how limited they are. And so it's, it's and we want to know afterwards when we see them uh, how they're doing. And, and KCCQ just standardizes that uh, basic need for an assessment of how a patient feels. But shouldn't we have been doing that all along as we practice medicine, uh, whether it's TAVR or PCI? I understand there are some other things in medicine, but I don't know much about them. But, I mean, you know, when you and I evaluate somebody with a complex coronary lesion yeah. uh, that's going to be a challenge to open up, uh, we still ask uh, similar questions. How much of a problem is this for you? Uh, do you think you can go on like this? Uh, what kind of risk are you willing to undertake yeah. for us to get you feeling better? I mean, it, it, it's not that different. No, it's not. Um, but in this patient population, there are some challenges, and just from uh, an experience of, you, you see this 80-year-old person, they are symptomatic from the aortic stenosis, but they also have some COPD, they have other issues that may, orthopedic issues that may be limiting them. And so, uh, in following them, you know, you do see some people who don't improve, and trying to understand that um, uh, hopefully will lead to better uh, patient selection 
and hopefully will also allow patients to make more informed decisions where you know, we kind of generically give risk benefits of procedures to uh, patients in talking about therapeutic procedures like TAVR. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to individualize that with their particular situation, their constellation of comorbid conditions, and, and help them assess uh, how well um, they may do or, or may not do? Probably the need is more muted when we move to more lower risk patients where we're really talking more about uh, 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 avoiding the mortality of aortic stenosis and, and they're already fairly functional and they're not loaded with comorbid conditions where you're trying to sort out treatment effect. So we'll see how it e evolves, but I think it has been useful for developing uh, patient-specific uh, assessments of likelihood of, of benefiting from the procedure. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you gave us uh, what I think is truly an amazing lecture on the relationship between uh, institutional volume and outcomes. Uh, following TAPR, and, you know, that obviously is applicable in many other areas. Yes. PCI, uh, open surgery, transplantation. Um, and you, you gave us a little bit of a teaser. Uh, mentioned that you've got some uh, data that are currently embargoed, but are taken from the TVT registry, and, you know, I would bet are likely to be very, very powerful. When uh, those data are released, you're going to be in the position where you've made some people very proud of you and said, yes, these results uh, look very impressive. And there'll be another group of people uh, whom you're going to make very unhappy. So you're going to make some, some friends and some enemies depending on what the data look like. Uh, how are you going to manage that? Some people are going to be really pleased and some are going to be really mad at you. Well. Uh I think we all believe in scientific evidence needs to drive decisions and not opinions and uh, things need to be driven by patient needs and understanding the important balance between access and the quality of, of, of the treatment, uh, the outcomes. And, and so, uh, yes, this, this, there are controversies, some of them our, uh, reflect our biases and, and other interests, uh, and, uh, but we need that scientific information, and that's really the thing that's, that's driven us. That's what CMS really wants to know. They're, they certainly are under political pressures from various parties, and, uh, but they, they need to make decisions based on, on evidence. So I think um, that's where we start. Now, using the same data and using different statistical methodology and different inclusion and exclusions, you may have uh, very different answers to the same question. And that gets into the uh, uh, complexities of doing these kinds of analyses. And um, I still think uh, uh, we as non-statisticians uh, need to bring some uh, just practical looks at what we're seeing and saying, is this clinically important or not? I do think that since outcomes have dramatically improved in TAVR that, uh, uh, versus the early days, that uh, any ongoing volume outcome relationship is going to be uh, muted comparatively. But then again, we really uh, want to look at uh, Still, if it's a 50% difference in 30-day mortality between a low volume and a high volume site on average, because certainly there are outliers in, in both areas, um, that is clinically uh, relevant. Now, if the patient can't travel 200 sites down to Houston Methodist, then you need to uh, really take that into consideration. So uh, these are complex issues, but we we need these debates in medicine. Well, it's complex, but on the other hand, as, uh, as the risk decreases, and as 
the population becomes aware of that, uh, the expectations increase. Very true. And um, if we talk about a 2% mortality or a 1% mortality, uh, people are going to expect that they or their loved ones go through the procedure very smoothly, very differently than the way we used to set expectations uh, seven or eight years ago when we started doing TAVR. That, that's very true. And it also gets into the whole uh, comparison of surgical aortic valve replacement versus transcatheter aortic valve replacement because uh, uh, there is no doubt with the improvement of surgical skills and techniques that uh, uh, they truly have a very low risk of operative mortality. And yes, the recovery period is significantly different. But after that, then uh, people one year out are very similar. They've got a new valve, which gets us into where do we have to go from here? Well, we have to decide in whom TAVR is going to be the preferred versus uh, SAVR. Someone is going to be patient preference, but um, someone who uh, with TAVR had a significant risk of coronary obstruction, we know it's a disastrous complication. And if we can predict that sort of thing, then either they should have SAVR or we need to do something to modify the leaflet to prevent that. So I think we have a, a lot of things still to learn. And the whole issue, two other issues do come up, a uh, patient prosthetic mismatch. Uh, right. Howie Herman Penn, whose TVT registry to really show that a significant proportion of people having TAVR uh, by formal definitions of patient prosthetic mismatch have it. Uh, their effective orifice is not as big as what they need. Now, the hemodynamics are actually better with TAVR than with most surgical valves, but patient prosthetic mismatch is a, a factor. And the second is the durability of these valves. And uh, um, we can just think of how practice would change if we see at 10 years significant differences in durability in either direction of, of, of a surgical valve outlasting a TAVR valve. You know, the early indications from Europe and the Danish study is quite, it's the opposite. TAVR looks like it may be a little more durable. And what are the determinants of that? Is it the different valve types? Uh, you know, the uh, uh, core valve Evolute has a bigger effective orifice than the Sapien 3, uh, especially in smaller valve sizes uh, and in valve and valve. So I think uh, we're living, Neil, in a, in a fascinating period of time where, number one, patient quality of care is improving dramatically. Options are, are out there, uh, but we're uh, only halfway down the road of, of learning more. And the road never ends, as you know. Uh, yeah, I, I would say halfway is probably a very generous estimate. Mm. And you haven't even mentioned uh, what do we do with asymptomatic patients if we truly have a low-risk procedure, and we'll learn a little more in two weeks. If the TAVR risk is lower than the surgical risk, then uh, we really have to turn attention to the patients in whom we wouldn't operate now because we don't think they're sufficiently ill to undergo a surgical procedure that carries some risk. That's a great point. And from the days of Brown Hall, Wald, you know, the indication for doing something is the onset of symptoms. Right. And a lot of that was driven by the risks, as you pointed out, of the treatment were not insignificant. But if you lower the risks, then you get into the paradigm of surgical mitral valve repair and asymptomatic individuals and trying to prevent some of the long-term consequences of the left atrium dilating, et cetera, and leaving people with, yes, a good functional mitral valve, but now they're living with chronic AFib, uh, sometimes LV dysfunction. And AS is the same, where uh, while people may still be asymptomatic, there are fundamental changes going on in the structure of the heart that may portend that they may not be, quote, cured after they get a new valve. They're living with uh, persistent LV diastolic dysfunction from fibrosis, other issues. So 
that's a fascinating area to see whether there are fundamental changes of timing of valvular intervention as we go forward. You know, I, I think if we get to that point, that's going to be true disruption of our way of thinking. Yeah, it is. Uh, but um, time will tell. Um, and, and wouldn't it be nice if we actually had an approach to prevent degenerative valve disease? And that's where it was a great disappointment that the statin trials of slowing the progression of aortic stenosis failed. But, you know, I wonder if uh, in those trials we just didn't get to the disease too late. It may be. It may be, although, again, um, you're 80, when you calculate the number of times that the valve opened and closed, yeah. it's in the billions. And you know, we, we know of, in manufacturing of autos, et cetera, it's, uh, things, parts wear out over time. And is there really a pharmacologic or a lifestyle intervention that may change that basic paradigm? I mean, we're, we're, uh, Taver's kind of, now um, the rite of passage of becoming old, like getting your cataracts, getting your hip replacement, parts wear out, and Just so. Just wait till people start living to 140, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Then everyone's gonna get it. Well, um, we'll see how that evolves. Well, I, I'd like to see how it evolves. I don't know if I'll get to. <laughs> um, the TVT uh, obviously has consumed a tremendous amount of your energy. What did you have to give up to do that? Well, uh, several things. Um, I, my uh, clinical time had to be uh, cut back. It is quite uh, time consuming. Um, and yeah, personal time. I think all of us who have um, academic careers know that the rigors of what we do clinically moves those activities to evenings and, and, and weekends. Yeah, and increasingly but, so as, as our environment changes. Yes, and as our environment and we all are held accountable for our views and covering salaries, etc. cetera. But um, I looked upon this opportunity to participate in this as um, this is my payback. This is my service to the, the country. I was never in the military, uh, um, but I all, always thought that we should rise above our individual needs and think of things we can do to serve our communities. And this was one that was very obvious to me. And it did help draw upon my experience. And, um, and I just said, this is, this is great to participate, to volunteer my time in something that was such a huge magnitude effect and is relevant because, hey, we're baby boomers and we're heading yeah, into we that are. age, our valves, and we want to have these treatments available. So I've, I've loved that. And, and our colleagues in surgery and cardiology, um, the national level, are just amazing people. And so it's been professionally, it's very stimulating working with the Michael Max and the Ralph Brindises and the David Holmes, and it could go on. Uh, these, these people have changed history, and uh, it's wonderful to be a small part of that. Well, great. So, John, thank you very much for coming to Houston. I think we've benefited tremendously from your visit. Wow. It's been great being here, Neil, and reconnecting.